uh, to begin with, but my name is Alex Wade, as I said, a director of Wade Environmental. And what we do is we are a specialist consultancy within the pest management industry. Um, so just these, but today we're gonna to be talking about rats and mice. We're gonna be talking about insects. So cockroaches, uh, mites and flies, all pests that you commonly find within food establishments. And also we're gonna talk about what it is that makes a pest. So first things first, a pest is defined by one of three categories. The propensity to, uh, the propensity to cause damage, to cause distress or to spread disease. And so with this, all of these pests, all of the animals that we are talking about today have the capacity to do one, if not multiple um, of these factors. Um, additionally, what you also have to keep in mind is the difference between what we call pest control and pest management. They are two very different aspects, which I'd like to just introduce you to. So first things first, pest management uh, is the responsibility of everyone. Pest management is the overarching process. It is making sure that facilities are kept clean. It is making sure that um, there is no food waste. It's making sure that products and um, the placement of materials are not conducive to provide harborage for pests. So that's pest management. Pest control is the reactive process of removing a pest from an environment after it has become established. So with that, your pest management teams internally or those that you bring out from externally uh, are what undertake pest control. However, it is the responsibility of everyone from the site owner to yourselves to make sure that the environments are not conducive to pests. They are not um, encouraging pests in one shape or form by providing either food, water or harborage. Uh, so if we then talk about what makes a pest, as I said before, it is one of three factors. It is the ability to spread disease, it is the ability to cause distress, and it's the ability to cause damage. Uh, but there we go. So the concept of disease is an interesting one um, because it's one that's often overlooked, um, but there is this term called zoonosis, which I'm sure coming through COVID, you guys have all heard, and it's about diseases that are capable of jumping the species barrier. So all animals will have diseases specific to them. It's very unlikely that you're going to give your dog your cold. It's equally unlikely that your dog's going to give you kennel, uh, like their kennel cough. However, there are multiple diseases that are capable of jumping this species barrier. And these are what we call zoonotic diseases. And they are very difficult to track and control. If you remember COVID, it was very difficult, even with mobile phones and people checking in to understand how these things moved. Then take away from the fact that we have that high level of visibility and you apply that to a rat or a cockroach or a fly. And suddenly these zoonotic diseases travel in mysterious and terrifying ways. And with all of these things, um, the risk of disease transmission always increases with a risk to exposure. So especially if you have a confined environment like an automated machine where you have a lot of pests congregating, the potential for disease transmission increases as you have that focal bottleneck point. Now distress, um, I had some wonderful pictures of rats in vending machines and jumping all over pastries and stuff, but distress is probably more easily thought of, uh, not as someone jumping up on a chair and screeching when they see a rat or a mouse or a cockroach or a spider, but more in terms of psychological damage. So in reality, there is very being very clearly um, cl clinical studies showing that pests um, will cause things like depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, agitation, uh, delusionary parasitosis, uh, a whole host of different psychological um, impacts as a result of having pest infestations. Um, damage is, is one that's quite easy to rationalize. They will literally store, they'll eat the food, they'll eat the raw materials within your uh, automated machines. But not only that, they will cause damage to the structures of the machines themselves. Rats and mice will chew wires and cabling, uh, and they will cause short circuits at best. If worst, they can even set um, electrical appliances on fire by causing these short circuits. Things such as insects will destroy the fabrics within that. So you'll have things like textile moss will destroy fabrics found within these uh, machines. You'll have things like boring insects that can damage some of the structural elements of it as well. And of course, then there's a damage to reputation and a damage to goodwill. If people see a huge number of pests within a certain environment, um, they cease to have any faith that that environment is 
secure or safe and that that leads into some of the legislation where it is the legal responsibility of the sites to make sure that they are not um, prejudicing food so with that you have a damaged reputation and a damage to goodwill so when we talk about rodents it's all about knowing your enemy and it's all too easy to pass off rats and mice as just mindless vermin but the first thing you need to keep in mind is that the word rodent literally comes from the latin to gnaw. These animals uh, have incisors that are constantly, constantly growing. And in order to keep them in check, what they need to do is they need to gnaw on just about every object in their environment. And so with that, it's quite interesting. You can use that behavior to actually follow and understand where these animals are going. But additionally, what they're doing when they're gnawing is they're causing a tremendous amount of damage. So just to discuss some of the things to look out for when you're looking for things like rats, for example, you'll be looking for footprints so footprints either in softer uh, you know soft or, or dust is probably going to be more applicable to you guys but more not you know it's it's that old axiom um pest management is all about knowing your um poo and with that you know it's looking for the feces of these animals is always a very good clue so the droppings of rats in particular are going to be uh, relatively large they're going to be about a centimeter if not slightly yeah, more they're like going to be tapered at one end and they're going to be blunt at the other so they look like little torpedoes but everywhere rats go and in fact everywhere rodents go they will leave greasy smears along yeah. from their coats their coats which are quite clean but covered in oil as they run alongside objects they'll create a greasy smear and a track mark mice on the other hand it's very much the same thing. Their droppings, however, are much smaller. They're more spindling. They're about to the size of a grain of rice. And they also leave behind what we call urine pillars, where rats and mice actually communicate with their urine. They, they are able to hold their bladders, but they electively choose not to because they will express proteins and pheromones within their urine, which will allow them to communicate with one another. And mice do this so prolifically that actually they will create tacky little pillars of urine on top of objects, which look like um, little, little blobs of molasses. Now, while we talk a little bit more about rodents, um, I want you to ask yourself, you know, when we think like human beings, um, we are very visually orientated animals. We're all looking at this screen now. We should be looking at my presentation, um, but we're all looking at the screen. Secondly, then we all listen to things. And then out of our other senses, our senses of smell, touch and taste, I would argue that actually um, if I was to find a miscellaneous stain on my cuff, for example, I would smell it before I touched it, definitely before I tasted it. However, when it comes to rodents, this is not the case. Um, they are very heavily driven by their sense of smell, and then they are driven by their sense of touch, hearing, taste, and sight. But it's their sense of smell which is driving them more than anything else. So when you're trying to get into the mindset of a rodent, when you're trying to think about what it is that's drawing them in or what's um, causing them to make these navigational cues, it will almost always be their sense of smell and almost never their sense of sight. Now their teeth, as I mentioned before, are these fantastic objects of breaking into various, um, you know, they, they historically, um, what they were used was to break into hard seed pods. And actually the enamel within their teeth sits around about three and a half, uh, which is roughly the same as mild steel or untreated steel. So anything you can scratch with a cheap pen knife from the market, a rodent will have a fairly good go of breaking into. And as I said before, they're chewing for two reasons. They're, number one, they're chewing to gain access into things to find those sources of food. Number two, they're chewing just to simply keep these teeth in check. So not only are they doing damage, they're also gaining access. Now, as I mentioned before, their sense of sight is terrible. It's about 200, 20 over 600, which means that if they were to read a sign, that sign at 20 feet away would need to be roughly 600 inches high, which is, I think we can all agree, fairly terrible. But with that as well, they're also dichromatic. They can only see in greens and blues. So they are, to all intents and purposes, um, colorblind as a, as a human being would. Um, and their eyes are positioned on the top of the head, which is highly indicative of an animal which is a prey animal. So all of their behavior, this running alongside objects, this um, operating at night, is all because they are at the bottom of the food chain. So they can be highly cryptic and they will hide throughout the day, of course, when we are active, which means that in reality, we often don't see rats and mice themselves. We simply just see the evidence of them. 
However, that being said, um, about 10% of any rat population will be active during the day. So if you are to see a rat or a mouse during the day or one that is uh, breaking into your machines or in your establishments, um, where there's one, statistically speaking, there's likely to be about nine more. Now, if they're not using their eyes to find, then they have to use their sense of smell. And about 1% of a rat's genetic code is totally involved with their sense of smell. And you might sit there and be listening to me and think 1%, that's not, you know, that's not a statistically large number. But actually, when you consider that it's only 2% genetic drift between different species, you know, 1% uh, of anything is actually a huge amount of information to apply to any just one part of a body, one sense organ. Um, and I had some lovely videos where you can see rats navigating their environment with nothing more than their sense of smell. And whereas our sense of smells tend to be linked to memory, uh, that smells like tomatoes, that smells like strawberries, that smells like burnt toast, um, we are saying that smells like, we are associating a smell with a memory. But with rats and mice, their sense of smell is actually hardwired into their brain. So they're not saying, you know, that smells like butter. They're saying, no, that is butter. That is, I don't believe it's not butter. They are able to tell chemically with their noses what it is that they are smelling well before they've engaged it, which can be quite a challenge for pest management, trying to get them to eat something that they don't necessarily want to eat. Uh, and talking of food, brown rats are omnivorous in the truest sense they will eat just about anything and mice are just the same they will break into anything they mice prefer more high calorie foods because they are a small sausage-like animal which bleeds a lot of heat into the environment and so they need a higher calorie content in order to keep their body temperatures up but the problem with rodents when they eat uh, our food is the contamination aspect they will actually destroy more food through contamination and they actually will do through consumption alone so when they run over food they'll be urinating on it they'll be defecating on it um, but not only that they'll be having the mechanical transfer of diseases as we said before if that rat has just popped up from the sewer and it's then running through on the inside of one of your machines or similar then it's not just bringing what's on its uh sorry, it's not just um eating the food in there, but it's also dragging in mechanically all of those various bacteria, bacteria and pathogens found in those dirty environments. If you've got a mouse that's jumped into the waste refuse bin outside and then hopped out and run over some food, it's not just a case of the food that's damaged by consumption, but you know, all of that food is then deemed to be contaminated. So in a nutshell, that's our rodents. So let's have a little look about some of the insects. So what we're dealing with when we talk about insects is actually insects are from the phylum arthropoda which means a jointed leg and all arthropods grow by shedding their cuticles uh, and when they do this they'll shed their cuticles they'll shed their exoskeletons they'll leave a molt behind and you'll see a soft white pulpy animal which over the course of several hours to several days will harden into a larger version that it was before but that being said actually insects go through two forms of growth you'll have a complete metamorphosis and an incomplete metamorphosis. And this is very important for pest management and it's very important for you too, because actually animals that go through a complete metamorphosis will go from an egg to a larvae, from a pupae to an adult. So there is four stages within that. And when you're planning any strategy to control an insect that goes under complete metamorphosis, it's important that you need to pay attention to the fact that there is a larval stage and an adult stage, because the larval stage will look and act completely different from the adult stage. If you think about it flies are probably the easiest ones to envisage here their larval stage is a maggot their adult stage is a fly the larvae is the one that is basically resource gathering it is eating the food it is contaminating that uh, food source and then of course they'll turn into a pupae they'll turn into an adult and the adult's job is to do very little the adult's job is to actually um find other adults to fornicate wildly and then to fly around and deposit those eggs onto new sources of food so with a complete metamorphosis you have two battlefronts here you have a larvae you have an adult you have a larvae which is doing all of the eating all of the damage all of the growing and then you have an adult which is doing nothing more than spreading those new larvae those new eggs far and wide 
Conversely, you have an incomplete metamorphosis and an incomplete metamorphosis doesn't have that pupil stage. You go from an egg to a nymph to an adult. And with that, the nymphal stage and the adult stages usually look very, very similar. So we're thinking about things like cockroaches here. So a young cockroach, a juvenile cockroach actually looks the same as an adult cockroach. It lives in the same places, it feeds on the same food. And with that, they can largely be controlled within the same program but it's all a case of being able to try and find them. So it's important to understand whether or not the insects you're dealing with are complete or incomplete, because having flies um, landing and moving all over your um, equipment is indicative of a problem somewhere else, for example, whereas cockroaches living inside machines is probably going to be the entire life cycle, the entire population living within there. Uh, again, Things like mites, they go through an incomplete metamorphosis. You'll find the entire population of mites inside. Whereas actually, when we talk about things, um, again, so fruit flies or drain flies, or even pesticide products such as beetles, the adults are an indicator of a problem elsewhere and vice versa. If you find a larvae, then you're going to have a problem with the adults elsewhere. So let me just talk to you very quickly about the different types of insects that we'll find. So for example, we will have cockroaches. Um, so cockroaches go through a complete metamorphosis, uh, sorry, incomplete metamorphosis. So the adults and the larvae, uh, the adults and the nymphs look very similar. Um, but cockroaches will produce eggs in the form of what we call uathiki which is a purse of eggs, and it can contain anywhere between eight and almost 30 with some species. And we have three species in the UK that we deal with most often. We have the Americans, which are relatively large. Um, we have the Orientals, which are a little bit smaller and they like it a little bit cooler. And then we have the German cockroaches, which are relatively small, um, but they have a very, very fast turnover. They can get from egg to adult in as little as 30 days within uh, ideal conditions. And so with that, we have three species of cockroach who are happy to occupy very different uh, environmental niches. You have the Americans, which like it warm and damp. You have the Orientals, which like it cool and damp. And then you have the Germans, which just like it anywhere, realistically speaking, inside. Things like the Americans and the Orientals, they'll take a long time to get to adulthood. We're talking several months, up to five months in some uh, instances. So you tend not to find big populations of these guys kicking up very rapidly. But things like the Germans, they're able to do this full life cycle in a little over a month and so forth. So populations of Germans can spring up literally and metaphorically very, very quickly. The other big pest that we're going to be dealing with in food environments is going to be flies and flies, all flies, will go through a complete metamorphosis, which means you'll have a flying insect, which we will recognize as being the fly. And then you have a larval stage, which is generally speaking, what we call a maggot and then a pupil stage, which is that caster that we see. And some of the flies that we deal with be things like house flies, blow flies and um, what we call then small flies, which are things like forids and fruit flies. Now, I would have been able to show you some pictures, but unfortunately I can't. But the wonderful thing about understanding what fly you're looking at is by understanding what species of fly that you're observing will tell you almost exactly where to start looking for the rest of that infestation. So for example, things like house flies, they will breed and they will lay their eggs on decaying organic matter. So you tend to find a lot of them congregated around bins. Blow flies such as the green bottle and blue bottle, they are almost always going to be laying their eggs on meat. So if you find a lot of green bottles and blue bottles, you know that it is a problem potentially with pet food or um, waste bins that are containing offcuts of meat. And then things like fruit flies and drain flies uh, are very closely associated with uh, sweet foods or drains, as the name may suggest. And they're very small species and they can go through an entire life cycle in as little as 10 days. So with animals such as flies that have these very short life cycles that can go from egg to adult and then be laying more eggs again in less than two weeks, the thing you really need to keep on uh, keep on uh, on top of there is environmental management. You need to make sure that you are taking bins out regularly. One of the biggest problems we've seen in pest management was when bin collections went from weekly to two weekly or even longer in some instances. And this allowed for not just one generation of flies to occur, but then a subsequent generation to get well underway, which meant that the numbers didn't just double, they ended up launching exponentially through the roof there. 
Um, we have a series of beetles, uh, coleoptera, which comes from the Greek word meaning kolos and terra meaning wing, kolos meaning shield. So these are all of those insects that have shielded wings. So with this, think about ladybugs. Um, they have those beautiful set of elytra covering their more delicate flight wings beyond, uh, underneath. But there is a host, and I mean, uh, as a certified field biologist, I had to learn the majority of them. And there are dozens and dozens, you know, 50 or 60 different species of small miscellaneous brown bug, about two millimeters long, where you have to identify them with nothing more than their antenna. And that's a subject for another time if you want to be thoroughly bored about funny bugs. But you do have a lot of them associated with not just food storage, but food preparation and food uh, delivery as well. And these will range from things like your larder beetles, which are destroying foods which are stored, all the way up to things like biscuit beetles, flower beetles, which are mostly involved with either the processing of raw materials or the storage of raw materials, especially things like tribolium. They are more than happy to live inside powdered material, as will their larvae. Now, probably the thing that you, uh, the two that we're going to cover last, and I think we'll just have just about enough time, are going to be ants and mites, because they are a significant problem within enclosed environments. But the first thing you need to understand about ants is they have this wonderful feeding and foraging strategy, which we call trophallaxis. And trophallaxis is the posh word for vomiting into each other's mouths. So if you take nothing away from today, please take that away, you know, just, uh, just as you disappear off to the pubs later on tonight, just bring up the word trophallaxis. But it's very important in terms of pest management because what will happen is you'll have scouting ants go out, they will look for sources of food, they will then find it, they will ingest some of that food into what we call a communal stomach. They will then run back, they will find other foraging ants, they will inform them by by via pheromone trail that there is food there but also what happens is that foraging train of ants is taking this food back into their communal stomach and then they are running it back to the nest well they will then either regurgitate uh, or they will carry that food into the nest where they'll feed it to the grubs and the queen because if you think about it the queen never actually leaves the nest after that initial period of scouting and establishment and this is fantastic in terms of pest management because it means that actually what we can do um, is we don't use things like powders and we don't use things like sprays for the control of ants. In fact, what the most effective tool for the control of ants is, is gels, edible gels, because what we're doing then is we're playing into this trophallaxis. We are taking the poison to the pest, or more specifically, the pest is taking the poison to the pest because these foraging ants will come out, they will find gels, they'll pick them up, they'll ingest them, and they don't immediately kill them. Actually, they're designed to either sterilize them or to kill them within one to two to even three days and the idea is then is you have a long train of foraging ants that will decimate uh, this insecticidal gel take it back to the nest feed it feed it amongst all the larvae and the queen and at that point you end up killing the nest from the inside it's a bit of a slow burner but you are guaranteed to control the entire nest there and we deal with two species well we deal with multiple species of ants in the uk but the two that most commonly crop up is the black ant the common garden ant which tends to come from outside to in and then we have the pharaoh's ant which tend to live inside objects so they tend to live inside electrical conduiting or they tend to live inside homes they're a tropical species of ants so they're very much at home inside heated units or even inside cooler units but living within the heat exchanges at the back where they're nice and warm and then moving inside and robbing all of that material from the inside. Now finally we have mites and there are lots and lots of different species of mites however the important thing to remember with mites is is they are highly dependent on humidity they're highly dependent on their environment and they need a source of food in order to survive. But their life cycle is phenomenally short. We are talking five days in some instances to actually start having the next generation. So the big thing with mites more than anything else is firstly that environmental control, bringing those environmental conditions down to a point which is not conducive for their survival. But additionally, if you're unable to do that, any treatment to get rid of mites needs to take into account this five day window, because if you do one treatment and then you do another treatment 14 days later, you will have a full two generations and you may even be in a worse space than you were before. So with this, you actually need to operate, you need to treat or you need to apply your controls within this five day window. And ideally, you need to have a three part control that sits within a single week so you can catch those animals as they emerge as those different uh, life stages 
present themselves. Anyway, I'm terribly sorry for this being um, less, less show and more tell, but I'm hoping that you guys got some value from this and you were able to follow along and listen to my um, dulcet tones at the very least. <laughs>